Hello and welcome to today's seminar titled We the People of the States of Bharat, which is second in our series India at 75. We'll be bringing some more interesting seminars around this theme. I am Sanjay Kumar, the India Country Director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. The mission of the Institute is to engage through interdisciplinary research to advance and deepen the understanding of critical issues relevant to South Asia and its relationship with the world. As part of this engagement, the Mittal Institute hosts a multitude of events covering topics in the arts, humanities, sciences, education, business, and more. We are so glad you joined us today, both here in this room and virtually. And please consider joining us for our upcoming seminars. A couple of housekeeping items for today. As this is a hybrid seminar, session will be recorded during the question and answer session. For those who are joining virtually, you can submit questions directly to moderator via the Q&A function on Zoom. Due to the large number of attendees at today's seminar, we unfortunately will not be able to cover all questions. Without further ado, ado I would like to invite Professor S.B. Subramaniam of Harvard University. He is a professor, professor of population, population health and geography and director of university-wide initiative on applied quantitative methods in social sciences, author of 700 plus articles, book chapters, and books. He is a co-editor in chief of the International Journal of Science and Medicine, editorial consultant to the Lancet and International Advisory Board member for the Lancet Global Health. I would request Subhu to introduce the topic and the speakers for today. I would also like to welcome and thank Dr. Sanjeev Chopra for being the lead speaker and Dr. Amna Mirza for being the discussion today. Thank you for being with us today and over to you Subhu. Uh, th thank you, Sanjay. C can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sanjay, for, uh, for facilitating this event and uh, also to your team at, at the Mittal Institute. Uh, Dr. Chopra, uh, what an honor to be, uh, to be a part of this event and uh, my most sincere apologies for uh, not being able to be present uh, in, in person. Uh, uh, for this particular event. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Dr. Amna Mirza uh, for joining this event uh, uh, in, to, to sort of be a discussant. I'm look, really looking forward uh, to, to this event. Um, as everyone knows here, we are gathered here to learn and discuss about the uh, evolution of uh, India's uh, internal boundaries. Um, this is a topic uh, very few people have thought in such a, uh, uh, organized way in a systematic way that it lends itself to almost like a field. And I cannot think of anyone, uh, uh, you know, better place to educate us uh, on this other than Dr. Sanjeev Chopra. I say this because the topic is extremely complex and a very vast subject. Um, and this I have learned over my interactions with uh, Dr. Chopra, but both his background, you know, he's, I say that he's best suited uh, because it's very hard for me to slot him in one category. You know, he's, I can think about him as a historian. Uh, he has education in law, history. He, he's a political scientist. He consumes literature in a, in a very, from vast areas. He, he's a creator and curator of a literary uh, events and uh, promoting uh, the expression uh, of creative expressions. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, last but not the least, uh, a retired uh, administrator from India's topmost service. It's almost like, seems like a second thought after the rich discussions that I've had the fortune of having with Dr. Chopra over the last year or so. And of course, without his knowledge, he has also turned into a geographer more recently, you know, uh, through this project. Uh, although he, uh, uh, I will let him speak uh, about how he got motivated about this or during our, our discussion. Uh, Dr. Chopra is, uh, also has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Robert McNamara fellow at the World Bank and a very prolific writer um, in, in, uh, in uh, he has several books as well as he contributes almost on a weekly basis uh, to discussing various projects. And of course, off recently on this idea of uh, how states have evolved in India. Uh, besides his current interest, he's also contributed much to the field of cooperatives in India, both through his experience as an administrator, but also as an institution builder 
and uh, uh, on this topic of cooperatives, which is extremely critical. So uh, with that, like, you know, I, I want to sort of uh, not take too much time. I had the fortune of getting acquainted with the Dr. Chokra um, uh, as the director of the Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy of Administration, which is from where he retired early this year. Dr. Chopra, what a pleasure. And once again, my apologies for not being able to be there in person. Uh, let me briefly also introduce Dr. Uh, Amna Mirza, who is a faculty assistant professor at Pol in political science at Delhi University. She's a recipient of the Godfrey Phillips Golden Ovary Award. Um, and, uh, and she has been kind of, I believe, like, you know, working a fair bit uh, on global governance, you know, and I'm really looking forward uh, to, to hearing her thoughts on, on Dr. Chopra's uh, topic. Before we dive in, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, the, the topic that Dr. Chopra is uh, going to be talking about to us. Um, this is, will le it has lent itself to a book. You know, it's uh, that's the depth of the the content you're talking about. Of course, squeezing that in 40, 45 minutes is going to be a hard task. Uh, but I'm just going to sort of uh, you know hand this back to the team there uh, to play a very short video from uh, uh, from the publisher of the book from Harper Collins on this. Sanjay, back to you. Hello everyone, I hope you're having a good evening. My name is Siddesh Inamdar and I am executive editor for nonfiction books at HarperCollins India. Like all of you, I was very much looking forward to being there at IIC to attend Dr. Sanjeev Chopra's talk on the subject of We the People of the States of Bharat. But unfortunately, I have not been able to make it there. Fortunately though, and it's my great privilege and honor to be announcing this. HarperCollins will be publishing Dr. Chopra's book on the same subject. It will also have the same title as that of today's talk. It will be called We the People of the States of Bharat, the Making and Remaking of India's Internal Boundaries. Publishing around August next year, it will be the highlight of our list of books that we'll be publishing to mark India's 75th Independence Day. I know and I'm sure that every publisher out there will be publishing a whole range of books to mark this special occasion. But if today's talk is any, is any indication, I'm sure you will agree that this one will be special. So do look out for the book in August next year and make sure that you buy your copy once it's out. Thank you and have a good evening. Um, excellent, yeah, um, th thank you so much. Uh, I guess the plan would now be, I'll hand it uh, over to Dr. Chopra to, uh, to, to talk about uh, over the next, uh, this topic over the next 40 minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes and then uh, we will uh, uh, hopefully have uh, some time for uh, for discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Chopra. Thank you so much, uh, Subhu. If I can call you Subhu, and we, in fact, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, you know we met around January this year, and it's been a wonderful friendship. We spent uh, a lovely time in the Gandhi Smithy Library at the LBS NAA. Uh, yes. For some time in the NCGG, it was absolutely stimulating discussion because I come from the the field of history. I just got looking at maps and he was a profound geographer. So it was really a wonderful interaction with him. And you know, he was able to teach me or, or guide me with a lot of methodological issues, which I have been a sort of a bureaucrat and a journalist. And uh, But he is a profound scholar. And therefore, one has learned a lot from him. Thank you so much, Mr. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Amnaji, for being here. Thank you, Sanjay. For organizing this, we are delighted that we have with us a distinguished member of parliament. Sujit Ji is here, Mr. Arun Prashar is here, Mr. Bhagat, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> now, 
Uh, and thank you, Siddhesh, for your lovely introduction to the book. Okay, friends, we're going to be talking about We the People of the States of Bharat. Now, the reason for choosing this uh, title is that, you know, the, the preamble to the Constitution talks about We the People. And then we go to, why don't you put on the first slide, Amna? And then we go on to say that India, that is Bharat, is a union of states. Now, there's a little, there's a, there's a very interesting thing here that at one level, we the people, that is we, all the people in this country have constituted Bharat, right? And yet we cannot constitute Bharat without the states. So it's a very interesting thing. And, and therefore the other aspect is that why the, why the territory of India is sacrosanct? The article one defines the territory of India. We know that article three also gives us the, the exact descriptions. Yet these internal boundaries of this country have been changing right from 1947. And this is something which is fascinating because there is no other country in the world. I've been trying to look at, you know, we look at the large maps, even Europe has not changed so much internally as India has. Because when India got her independence uh, on the 15th of August, 1947, there were nine states, nine provinces as they were then called, and 562 odd princely states. Now getting them all, and the interesting thing is that today, there is not one state, one province, which has the same name or the same territory or the same nomenclature or the same configuration as it was at that time. Not Odisha, not Punjab, not Haryana, not UP, not Kerala, not Karnataka. So this entire internal churn, how this has taken place and what have been the implications of this churn, I carry this little story forward to you because as the stories began like this, that you know, I had taken the IAS officers, the 2000. Uh, 19 batch, uh, we had gone to the Survey of India to see how new survey techniques are developing. And one started looking at the maps and one saw that every time the map of India changes, every time the political configuration of India changes, the Survey of India has to come out with a new map. And so I started looking at the maps and then I thought, let's start writing about it. And it's been a fascinating story since then. So the name itself, the name itself, India and Bharat. Now, the Britishers wanted us to call ourselves Hindustan. They wanted it to be Hindustan and Pakistan. Now, at that point of time, we decided not to keep the name Hindustan, but chose India, that is Bharat, and decided on India. Now, why we chose India and not Hindustan also, as I find from, from archival records, is that had we chosen the name Hindustan, then British Empire would have been divided into Hindustan and Pakistan. So we would not be the normal successor state to, in, to, to British India. By choosing the name India, so India then becomes the natural inheritor of everything that British India stood for. Now, it's it's both semantics and it's also deep, deep understanding. And I think the credit for that goes more to Mr. Menon uh, than even to Sadar Patel, because he was a man who was uh, who, who knew the constitution very well. He was also the advisor to Lord Bevel and then to Mountbatten. So he really understood and grasped this aspect. Now, what would have been the implications if, if we had chosen to call ourselves Hindustan and Pakistan would have been then every bit of territory and every embassy in the world would have to be divided between India and Pakistan. By deciding to be the successor state, we chose that. Otherwise, in Pondicherry also, Puducherry now, Pondicherry at that time, it was one third Muslim. So they would have said, all right, make one third of Pondicherry into Pakistan. So that is the much larger implication of that. And let's also realize that you see there was the uh, 1947 to 1950, that is the first phase of administrative change in the country, which happened. A lot of people feel that it happened because of administrative reasons, but let's also realize that there was a major movement in all the states of the country. There was the Prajamandal movement, uh, which meant that even when the Rajas or the sovereigns wanted to align with, uh, with, with anybody else, the people there were very close and wanted to be part of the much larger territories, much larger ethnic territories which they, which they wanted to have. So at that point of time, you see the first map of India, you find that a lot of it the areas in yellow are what we are, what the what the princely states were. So the princely states had 52% uh, of the area and 48% of India's population. So getting this all into one arrangement is something which is fascinating. So you find that, uh, you know, paramounts, he had lapsed and, you know, there was the instrument of accession. And I want to make it very clear that we use the term instrument of accession is one aspect. The second is the merger agreement. The instrument of accession only gave three rights you know, defense, communication, external affairs. But the merger agreement was that all right, you take your privy purses 
And now that you've taken your previous verses, you are merged into the larger aspect of India. So you at that time you had you find you know you find Pepsu, you find Rajasthan, Madhya Bharat. I mean states whose name uh, some formations like Matsya Pradesh. I mean you don't see it in any map of the country. But there was a formation called Matsya Pradesh, which never came into, which was which which came between 1947, moved out before 1950 even happened. So you had let's move on uh, because we have a limited time, and let's move on to the next slide. So uh, between the first you saw the map of India in 1947 and the map of India as a republic. So between 1947 and 1950. The changes that took place were that we uh, got the most of the state, most of the princely states, with the exception of the larger states like Jammu Kashmir, uh, you had Hyderabad, and Bhopal. Bhopal was merged here, and Mysore. So these were the three states which were 21 gun salute states, which retained their identity. All the others were asked to either make unions of states or they became part of their own. We constituted these states, like Pepsu, for example. Pepsu was actually Patiala and East Punjab States Union, so that came up. And you know, you find a very interesting thing that at that point of time, at that point of time, the, 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 there was a lot of movement by the Praja Mandal itself to get these states together. So we now come, in 1952 was the first time you got a Hindi map in India. The first time that we got a Hindi map of India. So at that point of time, you find that the names have all changed. I mean, Uttar Pradesh has become, uh, sorry, United Provinces has become Uttar Pradesh. The names have started changing. And uh, what we find is, you know, that uh, this is the time when, I mean, we're talking about name changes now, but at that time also, there was a whole movement, Ganges to Ganga, Mutra to Matra, Jalandhar to Jalandhar. So this whole set of things and how these names change over a period of time, how names are so significant, that is something which I bring out, you know, where in my book. Uh, so then you find that Bombay is still, I mean, now, of course, it is Mumbai. I mean, so what I'm trying also to show is that there is not one state in the country which has the same name. Uh, Lakshadi, for example, was Nakadiv, Amdavi, and Minikoy Islands. And they were under two regimes, you know, there was under... Part of it was in the North Malabar district, part of it was in the Cochin. So every part of the country, so the Britishers, when they had the regime in the country, they were only looking at an administrative construct. And this administrative construct did not pay any attention to language, did not pay any attention to ethnicity. In fact, most states in the country were multilingual, multi-ethnic, and the voting share, I mean, the number of people who could vote was very limited. You know, so at all points of time, even though we had uh, regular elections, uh, I mean, elections that started from 1935, but it was a very limited mandate that these things had started. So uh, this is 1952. Now, two, three points about 1952 is very significant. For the first time, the word China appears on the map of India. The word Chin you will find on this map. You know, up there, the word Chin appears. Before that, the Britishers never used the word China on the map of India. So, you know, it also shows that at that time we were perhaps politically a bit naive because we did not realize the implications of what happens when you put something on the map. Before that, it was shown as Tibet. For the first time in 1952, the, the name Chin or China, here it's Chin, appears on the map of India. And then, as I will show later, in 1956, Tibet disappears from the map of India. Now, here Tibet is still shown. But in 1956, Tibet disappears from the map of India which means that all those who went to school, uh, I mean, all those who must be, you know, five, six years old and who, you know, studied, at that time, there was no existence of Tibet for, in India. You know, so it also shows that, uh, that, 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 you know, and the Britishers were very clear about how they looked at borders. We perhaps did not look at borders so closely. That takes me to, uh, to a lecture which, which, uh, which uh, Lord Curzon gave in 1906, the Ramsey Lecture at Oxford. He said that the notion of borders in the West and the notion of border in India or in the Asia is very different. In fact, we had always an Aranya Kshetra, that is an area of large forest, you know, between two kingdoms. And Aranya means an area where there is no war, there's no conflict, there's no control. So we did not have such fixed boundaries. So the whole notion of a very fixed boundary uh, is, a, is, a, is, a Western, is a Western construct. And that is when Mountbatten's uh, cousin said, 
that you know where we have dense territories and dense populations we we'll have clear but they left nepa they left the northwest frontier province and they left tibet as large buffer areas these are areas which the british didn't want to rule directly but they also did not want anyone else to rule these so these were the buffer territories so that's another <clears throat> very interesting aspect about this so as we move on we'll come to this but i wanted to highlight the point that in 1956 map you do not find the reference of tibet at all <clears throat> tibet will again come back to us in 1959 but interestingly every blame cannot be put on this regime because tibet refused to recognize india china recognized india but tibet refused to recognize india in 1947 they said that unless you show darjeeling and sikkim as part of um, of tibet we don't recognize you so you first recognize that so in there was a little bit of a confusion at that point but in that process and that time you we were very close to china so we recognized china so let's move on to the next one uh, we are slightly short on time so i have to rush through the presentation so now what happened was that at in you know image one thing you must realize that the congress had decided that india must be divided on linguistic i mean the congress organization and the congress had the sindh circle the, the the gujarat circle the the maharashtra circle all these things the congress had already agreed from 1918 the provincial committees of congress were all based on linguistic lines and therefore the four people who played a very important role in the in 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 sort of freedom movement or in and deciding the way this country would move gandhi ambedkar patel and nehru now all of them disagreed on many things they all disagreed on many things but the one thing that they agreed on was that india has to be organized on linguistic lines on this they were all very clear so of course immediately after independence nehru felt that you know there are other pressing priorities in the country and we need not press the linguistic reorganization of state so clearly uh, he said that he had this feeling but immediately after independence the first uh forty srimalu he had this in fact before that also there was a, a, a hunger strike but the death of forty srimalu in for the demand of andhra pradesh in fact andhra had already been conceded had nearly been conceded but because of the resistance from 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 madras especially si raju gopal achari and also at that point of time they wanted to shift the water so water conflict also started at that time because it's actually a share of resources it's a share of water resources that that led to this so once the once forty three ramalu died uh, andhra had to be conceded but if andhra had to be conceded then the demand for the reorganization of states had to be accepted so uh, nehru had to announce very reluctantly the formation of the of the of the states reorganization commission with justice fazal ali as the chairman hn kunzru and hn uh, <clears throat> kunzru uh, fazal ali and uh, and kn panikar thank you kn panikar was the third person in this uh, in this group and the interesting thing about this says that they never agree i mean they did not agree on many things and the dissenting notes of uh, these people that is also reflected in the in the in the in the src report the src report and the mandal commission report are the two most well read reports in the country so uh, in fact sometimes i find that the number of hits on the mandal commission report are higher than the number of hits on the src but these are very closely competing reports and these are also the reports which have which have sort of defined the nation these are reports that defined the nation in the sense that the the map that you see in 1956 is actually a foundational map by this time andhra has been made and the other states have also been created in fact the, all the the reorganization of the south has taken place by the time in 19 can we i don't know whether we can get the 56 map uh, hmm. if it's possible to get the 1956 map i don't know whether we can get it but but you know in fact the the, the most uh, uh, the most uh, uh, interesting paper on uh, the linguistic reorganization of states was submitted by dr ambedkar way back in 1948 to the first committee which went into the linguistic reorganization of state uh, uh, dr ambedkar also received a delegation from the sikh leaders of punjab in which they wanted a separate area for the sikhs and dr ambedkar advised them that as long as you are asking for a linguistic province where the punjabi would be the dominant language we will support you we will go ahead with it but obviously you cannot divide the country you cannot have this thing so that's another instance that happened so 1956 uh, is the is then the is then the foundational uh, map of the country so as i mentioned here uh, this is fazal ali km panikar h n kunzru they submitted a 267 page report they had received about 1.5 lakh memoranda 
And wherever they went in the country, there were demonstrations and counter demonstrations. Some people wanted a state, other people did not want the state. So they did a sort of a great job in trying to, you know, uh, in trying to, to get to various things. But certainly, they were able to resolve the issues of the South. So the four uh, states in the South, that is Mysore, uh, at that time Madras, Andhra Pradesh, and Kerala, which came about when Travancore and Cochin uh, came together. That is something which, which happened at that time. So, in fact, uh, Ambedkar at that point of time also said that you're leading, you're, you're creating the balkanization of the South and the consolidation of the North. You know, so that is something. Uh, uh, not because you're sitting here, Sujit, but I must mention here that the one of the, the, the contribution of Hare Krishna Mahatab in the integration of Indian states is something which has not been recorded as much as it should have been done. In fact, his contribution, and I must place it on record, that his contribution, he was a very bold person. He had differences with Mr. Nehru also, but he was the one person who said that no. In fact, on Sikkim, he was very clear. He pointed out the, 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 the mistake that we are doing in not closely integrating it with the country. So uh, by this time, all this has started happening. Uh, uh, and this is 1956. But 1956 led to two bilingual states were still left, Bombay and Punjab. Now, these are the two states where, they, where, where uh, you know, because once you've accepted the principle of, uh, of linguistic, uh, uh, you know, of, of language being the basis, then the whole point was that if language is the basis for creation of Kerala, if language is the basis for the creation of Madras, still called Madras, not Tamil Nadu, then why is it that Bombay and Punjab have been left behind? Now, the reason for Bombay and Punjab having been left behind is also politics, is also a lot of other things. But one thing is that the SRC was always in favor, was always saying that states which are bordering, that border states must be large states. There must be states which should have the administrative wherewithal uh, to you know, take care of themselves. And that is why, uh, contrary to public uh, agitation, contrary to what the public wanted, uh, the SRC would not only uh, recommended that Punjab should continue to a big state. They also wanted the merger of Himachal Pradesh, the Union Territory of Himachal Pradesh also. They wanted that that should also be merged with Punjab, which led to a lot of dissent, a lot of uh, a lot of you know resentment in Himachal Pradesh because for the last seven, eight years, Himachal had emerged as the chief commissioner's province. And therefore, all this happened in 1956. Be that as it may, uh, the 1956 report was received well in the South but it met with a lot of resistance both in Punjab and in, and in, uh, and in the United Bombay. Now, Bombay, uh, the reasons for, for not being able to, you know, uh, to have Gujarat and Maharashtra was on Bombay City. Bombay City was the jewel in the crown, as they would say. And one proposal was that let's make Bombay into a union territory. Now, interestingly, all the major cities of this, of this country, major metros, there's always been a demand to have them as UTs. But there was a demand to have <clears throat> Bombay as a union territory. There was a demand to have Hyderabad as a union territory uh, much earlier, much earlier also. And, and in fact, Ambedkar had proposed that, Ambed that Hyderabad should be the winter capital of this country. Similarly, with Madras, uh, whenever that, when the conflict happened, both, uh, both uh, Andhra, both the Telugu speaking people and the Tamil speaking people, they wanted Chennai or Madras at that point of time uh, to be in that state. So the compromise, uh, Tirupati went to Andhra, and uh, there's a big dialogue on this issue on, on how Tirupati went to Andhra uh, and Chennai. Chennai is named after a Telugu goddess, incidentally. So Chennai continued to be part of Madras, and Tirupati, which has Tamil priests, went to Andhra Pradesh, and of course, a lot of linguistic, uh, and a lot of this territorial waters and other things happened. So to uh, so then we move on. So in 1960, in 19 by 1960. Now another an interesting thing is for especially for those you know none of the political parties, I mean the, the major political parties at that time could agree on what should be their view on the reorganization, because elections had to be fought in the state, but grand policy statements were to be made in the center. So the Communist Party of India could not decide on what their stand would should be because they had even supported the creation of Pakistan. They had wanted the acceptance of nationality as a principle. But by the time 56 happened, Nehru and Kosigan had been closing up to each other. And therefore, uh, the Communist Party of India could not really take a stand. The Congress stand was that we should have, I mean, they, they did not want to give too much emphasis on, on, on linguistic uh, reorganization. 
But such was the force of linguistic reorganization that the Congress had to allow its members to have a free conscience in submitting memoranda to the SS. Therefore, in Punjab, you had different congressmen submitting different kinds of memoranda to the SS. Some saying in favor of Maha Punjab, which was also a demand for the RSS and the RS Samaj and the Hindi press, and others saying that no, it should be a it should be a Punjabi uh, linguistic province. So that is a that's a fantastic story in itself. That how the national political parties could not really give a direction on an issue of this sort, because as I point out in my book, in my forthcoming book, that elections are fought in the state, grand policies are made in the center, and often there's a disconnect between the larger meta narrative that any political party, be it the Congress or the Janasang or the BJP or the Communist Party, whatever be the grand narrative on the ground, the reality is very different. And because elections determine a lot of things, so a lot of these things happen. Now, one very interesting interlude before 1956 happens, there is one instance of two states wanting to come together. That is Bihar and Bengal. In 1954, there is something called the Roy Sena proposal, BC Roy as the chief minister of uh, Bengal and Sri Krishna Sinha as the chief minister of Bihar wanted their states to come together. The reason for that is that uh, in 1953, uh, there was a Congress session held in Amritsar. And when B.C. Roy went to Amritsar and he saw the rehabilitation of refugees from Punjab, and he found that it has been done very well because Punjab at that point of time was a very big area, right up to Gurgaon. You know, it was the area of Punjab. <clears throat> and he felt that that all the people would come from, from, from East Pakistan. They were settled in Karnal, Panipat, Sonipat, Mursal, you know, Faridabad, Ghaziabad, uh, not Ghaziabad, Faridabad, Gurgaon. So this is where they got it. The, the, the people who lost their land in the canal colonies uh, in Montgomery and Lyalpur, they were all settled in Hisar and in Karnal, and they were at adequate tax there. On the other hand, the, the people who came in from, from East Bengal, Bengal, West Bengal was already very populated. And these people were sent, some of them were sent to Andaman, some of them were sent to Dandakaranya, some of them were sent to Pilibhid. So what happened was that there was no political voice for the Bengali refugees. And this area of Jharkhand was, uh, was, was still, I mean, there was hardly any population here. So B.C. Roy felt, and so did Sri Krishna Sinha felt that in order to create, uh, the, if it was the same administrative setup, the same political setup, then there would be a voice. For example, uh, displaced Punjabis coming from Pakistan, you know, did have a political voice and a political say in the then large Punjab, in the then large Punjab, which imagine now a group of 5,000 Bengalis suddenly being asked to go to Dandakaran, you know, or being asked to go to Andaman, or being asked to go to Pilipit, or being asked to go to Udham Singh Nagar, and you still find these colonies of Bengalis in Udham Singh Nagar. Now, so therefore, he felt that this is one thing, and this was welcome. This proposal was welcomed. The English press was gaga about it. The Congress party was also gaga about it. But on the ground, on the ground, there was no support for this proposal. Again, which shows that what the larger meta narrator, whatever the larger political leadership, or what may look administratively very sensible, what would look administratively very sensible, technically very feasible, economically justifiable, may not cut much ice on the ground. And therefore, the Royal Sena proposals had to be withdrawn. They had to be withdrawn very sheepishly. And I must also mention that the opposition to a united Bihar and Bengal came from the politicians of UP. Because the UP politicians felt that if Bihar and Bengal were to become one consolidated state, then the dominance of UP in the politics of India would get affected. And that is something which has always been a theme, a, a, a recurring theme. And we'll come to that when we talk about the limitation as well, because the dominance of one state in the overall polity of the country and uh, the, 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 the Congress leadership of UP did not like it. The Congress leadership of Bihar and Bengal also didn't like it. Now, this is, so 1960, uh, let me take on to 1960. In 1960, you find that Gujarat and Maharashtra have been created. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of lives were lost. We lost about 106 lives. Now, losing lives on agitation like this uh, is something which is very odd because much later, we realized that you know linguistic issues can be sorted out, but it was also the intransigence of Murari Desai and many other reasons. But let's not go into that. So 1960, when this happened, then Punjab remains the only remains the only bilingual state in the country, right? But before we come to that, now the next major change in the country, let's move on, is the creation of Nagaland. In 1963, for the first time, 
it was agreed because Naga insurgency has been the longest insurgency. And even two days ago, we've seen the very unfortunate event in Nagaland where, where we lost 13 people, case of mistaken identity. But Nagaland was one classic case of creating a state which was never meant to be uh, economically viable, never meant to be, never meant to be, because from the day Nagaland was created, it was very clear that this is a concession to an ethnic demand. This is a concession to an ethnic demand in the hope that we will be able to resolve ethnic insurgency in that area. Now, the moment Nagaland is created, the moment Nagaland was created, there was no way in which Mizoram would not have been created. There is no way in which Manipur would not have asked for the statehood. There is no way in which other small, Meghalaya would have happened. Because, you know, one of the things in politics is that one thing leads to a chain reaction. You could not have created Nagaland without then creating the entire, uh, all, the, all the sister states of the Northeast. So decisions in politics that happen at any point of time have very, very long-term implications. Very, very, whether they are right or wrong, uh, we'll know after 200 years, but, uh, you know, uh, this is what happened. So the creation of Nagaland is therefore a very important aspect where the political leadership overruled the SRC, overruled a lot of other things, and knew from day one that Nagaland will have to be sustained. But part of the part of the agreement with Nagaland was also the creation of a Naga force, I mean, a Naga battalion. Uh, a lot of credit goes to Major Bob Cutting, who was the, uh, in fact, Major Bob Cutting, a very remarkable person. He was the person who took over the Tawang Monastery uh, with Jairam Dam Dalat Ram, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, they, he later on became our ambassador to Myanmar, then called Burma, was the deputy commissioner of Makok Chong when this happened. And three people had to lose their lives. I mean, the, 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 the person who was designated as the chief minister, Sakire, then Mr. Ao. So two people lost their lives. I mean, chief minister candidates lost their lives, but we had this. Then the next step, the next phase in the reorganization of India's boundaries is, of course, 1965, uh, after the 1966, actually. 1965, we had the war with Pakistan. And after the war with Pakistan, it was realized that, you know, uh, you, you cannot have border areas with people not, with people not very, being very comfortable. So people need to have their own power. They need to have their own authority. So that's how this thing happened. Now, I, I mean, uh, you know, I've been telling the story so many times that I forgot about 1961. 1961 is when, when you know, I'll show the map of 1961. Can we go to the map? Of, in the map of 1961, you'll find that, you know, the map of 1961 had been made by the Surveyor General of India sometimes in October. Then in the month of December, we decided to take over Goa. I mean, decided to take over Goa means that, that the country decided that enough is enough. Uh, it's time that Goa came back to India. So we'd, rather than make a new map, those were the days of economy measures, I think. So they just put a black tape. So you find uh, earlier, in the earlier maps, Goa, it would show Portuguese position. So on this, they just put a black tape. So I've called this chapter Black Tape Over Portuguese Position. Now, you see, the how history is connected, if the Berlin Wall had not broken down, if the Berlin Wall had not, if the Berlin Wall had not been, they started setting up the Berlin Wall in 1961. When the Berlin Wall came up in 1961, all the focus of NATO was on the Berlin Wall. And there, an internal discussion happened in NATO that whether we will support each other anywhere in the world or whether our treaty is limited to NATO only. Before that, Portugal had been taking the plea that if there is a fight between India and Portugal, then Americans would move in anywhere, right? So that was the thing. But because Berlin Wall, it was only after the Berlin Wall that it became very clear. Now, you see, uh, let me tell you about how I, part of the way I've researched this is, you know, the best, not the best, I'm sure there are many other ways of looking at history. But, you know, after 40 years, the records of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of England have been declassified. Therefore, every fortnight, the High Commissioner of uh, UK in Delhi and the Deputy High Commissioners in uh, Bombay, Calcutta and Madras used to write a report to their head office in London, to the FCO office, detailing what has happened in the last 15 days. And they would set cuttings of newspapers, cuttings from Hindu, Hindustan Times, Times of India, Tribune. So all that is now freely accessible and freely available. Uh, so one must complement the, the, I mean, the, the record keeping and the Transparency Act in England that a lot of it is now available because that shows how the British foreign policy was being imagined. Because on the case of Portugal coming to back to India, we have dispatches from the, from the Portuguese 
uh, ambassador uh, of England in Lisbon, you know, talking about how Lisbon is reacting to them. And ultimately telling uh, the, those people there that now you have a conflict. You know, now you could choose between between the jewel and the crown. You know, I mean, because England was also notionally heading the Commonwealth, was also part of a lot of the NATO alliances. So they had to choose between whether they'll be here or whether they'll be there. So that's about the 1961, the Berlin Wall and the liberation of Goa. Uh, so I've covered 61, I've covered 65. We just got another 10 minutes, but let's move on. The next major, major, major change that... Uh, that because along with Nagaland is the dismember of member memberment of Assam that had to happen, and part of the reason why the dismemberment of Assam happened was that, and again that's that's one of those big ifs of history. Had Assam not been insistent on forcing Assamese in Mizoram and in all these other places, maybe Assam could have continued. But sometimes when you become very chauvinistic in your approach, when you become too chauvinistic in your approach, you alienate many other people. So that's what happened there. So in fact, the entire movement of whether it was the Mizos or the Nagas or the Meghalayas, they said, we would like to be a part of India, but we want out from Assam. They were very clear in that sense. So the sentiment was against Assam. The sentiment was not against India. And that's what we find you know, repeated in several so uh, several areas and several parts. Even during the GNLF agitation or things, I mean, they, the opposition is to is to Bengal. The opposition is not to India. Uh, both those opposition is not to India. The opposition is to Assam, the the state where they immediately come from. Uh, we'll move on now. And the next uh, major change in the in the geographical formation of India and the political geography of India is Sikkim. You see, because in 1974. The merger of Sikkim, and this is a map of 1979. I mean, the, the merger took place in 74, 75. So, you know, Sikkim, it is not very easy to just say that because the, the Constitution of India is very clear. So, the Constitution had to be amended. Uh, the 35th and the 36th Amendment took place to ensure that Sikkim is now made a part of India. Now, the story of Sikkim is also very interesting. That And that shows how, over a period of time, when demographics take over, Political changes have to take place. Sikkim was part of the Bhutia uh, tradition, part of the Lepcha. In fact, it was a Lepcha kingdom taken over by the Bhutias. And in 1870s, because they were mainly monistic in their approach, they invited the, the Nepali workers to come and cultivate the lands around the monastery. In 30 years' time, the population of Nepalese grew because they were more hardworking. And uh, I mean, uh, the, in, in the in the Buddhist tradition, a lot of them became monks. And uh, so, you know, what happened was that by the turn of the century, the turn of the previous century, the number of Nepalese and the number of uh, ethnic Bhutias and Lepchas was almost equal. And by 1947, the overall majority of Sikkimese was actually Nepalese. So in 1947, when the majority population of Sikkim wanted to be a part of India, they wanted to be a part of India. This is, this is a total... A uh, myth that is created by a book by Sunanda K. Uh, which is written totally from the Chogya's perspective that, you know, smash. And, uh, no, the fact is that the majority of the people at that time were Nepalese, and they had no stake in a system in which they did not get representation, in which they did not get the, in which they, you see, Sikkim Assembly was such that it had 20, 20, 20, 20 seats for Nepalese, 20 seats for Bhutias, and 20 seats for Lepchas. Whereas the population of Nepalese was about 65 to 67 percent at that time. So for 67 percent people, you give 20 seats. And these are all things that will come up again when we discuss delimitation. I mean, how do you manage uh, these, uh, these, these very difficult uh, questions which have no easy answers? So that is how Sikkim became a part of India. So that's uh, that we find in 1974. After that, there's been a, there's a little lull, of course. Uh, states, I mean, UTs are getting, um, uh, UTs are becoming states. So, you know, there's a gradual process. So Manipur, Tripura, first were chief commissioners, then they became UTs, and then they became states. The next major uh, reorganization that we find is then by 2000, there is a bipartisan consensus on the creation of Chhattisgarh, Charkhand, and Uttarakhand, Uttaranchal at that point of time. Now, by this time, the polity has matured. And by this time, what has also happened is that the BJP uh, has agreed in principle to the concept of larger states, uh, to, the, to the concept of breaking up of states. They realize that the breaking up of a, of, of a state or is, is not the breaking up of Bharat. You know, so that is, and that is why it's interesting to note 
that the term that the, the, the preferred term of BJP was not Charkhand or Uttarakhand. The preferred term for them was Vananchal and Uttaranchal. I mean, they sort of uh, were not very comfortable with the use of the word Khan. But the public demand was for the was for Uttarakhand, was for Jharkhand, and therefore over a period of time they accepted. And I think it's a it's a it's a it's a, it, these are these are the three states that were made with bipartisan consensus in the sense that that here the BJP and the Congress are both trying to claim credit for having created these states. So in Uttarakhand uh, or Uttaranchal, the BJP said we've done it. Congress said we have done it. Poor Uttarakhand Kranti Dal, which had raised the banner, you know, wanting a separate state, oh, that had got forgotten. They didn't even get a single seat. They got a seat once or twice. So they're totally lost in the whole thing. This is again a very interesting thing that Chhattisgarh and uh, especially Jharkhand, these are areas where the tribals, especially in Jharkhand, the tribals were no longer a majority, and yet even the non-tribals felt that it is better to have a, it is better to have a small state, a state with regional identities. So this creation of these three states, especially Chhattisgarh and uh, Jharkhand, is an example of how a regional identity is being forced in this country, how regional identity is being forced in the country. So around the turn of the century, we thought that all right, everything is OK. Now the country should have a, a fairly stable sort of a system. But then, you know, this agitation started. And now Telangana, uh, this, 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 this whole concept of that other than Hindi speaking states, all other states, all other languages at one state. So Bengal, Bengalis, Maharashtra, Marathas, you know, Tamil, you know, Tamil for Tamil Nadu, and then this whole lava burst in uh, in so far as uh, Andhra state is concerned. So Andhra has had three formations. You had Andhra state, that is Andhra 1.0. Then you had Andhra Pradesh, which is 1.1 uh, and 1.2, and then you finally have Andhra and Telangana. Now Andhra and Telangana. Let's understand the fact that although Hyderabad was Telugu speaking, uh, and so were the other parts. Yet the tradition of Hyderabad and the Telangana region was very different from the Andhra region. So for one, the hinterland was Chennai, for other, the hinterland was Bombay. So a lot of things happened. And finally, as we are all aware that in 2014, uh, we had, uh, again, there was a bipartisan consensus here. I mean, everybody said this and that. Even the TDP at some point of time said that let's stay, let there be two states. So Telangana comes. Now when Telangana is made, that opens up, that really opens up the whole possibility. And that's something that we'll have to discuss. That opens up the whole possibility that if, if, if one, uh, if, if Telugus can have two states, why should a large state like Maharashtra not have two states? I mean, why can't there be two states in Maharashtra? Why can't there be two states in Tamil Nadu? What should be the size of the state? What can be the possible size of the state? These are all things that start happening. So. And the last major change that I'll talk about before we move on to the next very important subject of delimitation is the creation of, uh, of the Union Territories of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, before that happens, I want to tell you that in 1947, the name of the state actually was Jammu wa Kashmir wa Tibet wa Ladakh wa. So the actual official name of Jammu at 9, 1947 was Jammu Kashmir Ladakh and Tibet. Oh, that was the mental concept. I mean, that was, in fact, there are stamps issued in that name. Uh, there's a coinage of that time uh, is representing of these. So the entire, so from this, we link up to the entire the issue that we have, the sky chain and all. So it is not that the claims to Tibet, the claims to Tibet that we have, or the portion of Tibet that we have, comes from the fact that, that this area was part of the geographical construct of Jammu Kashmir. And of course, uh, Gilgit Baltistan had been leased out to the British by by the then uh, sovereign of the thing. But in, in 2000 and, uh, 2019, 5th August, a very important day. Uh, 5th August is a very significant day. So on 5th August uh, 19, uh, 2019, the state of Kashmir, uh, the, the, the state of Jammu and Kashmir uh, became the Union Territories of Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. Now, what I want to tell you here is that Ladakh is in 1948. I don't know, can we go back to the map of 1947? You see, at that point of time, the entire area of Peri Garhwal, Lahore, Spiti, all that was part of British Punjab. And the Ladakhis at that point have said that, you know, please merge us. Please merge us with Lahore, Spiti and Garhwal. Because they felt that Lahore, Spiti and Ladakh were much more closer to each other, ethnically, linguistically, and on the basis of religion than 
there. So they wanted that. So you see this, this area, there is a little continuity. So that area, so they, we could have had, even at that point of time, a very strong Himalayan state up in the north. But that was not, in fact, once Ladakh was made, uh, the Ladakh Buddhist Association uh, went on record by saying that our demand from 1948 of wanting to get out of, uh, of, of Kashmir has finally been accepted. So they, they thanked the thing. So these are the, the interesting uh, stories about the, so Lakshadweep and Andamans I want to share with you. Then Andamans, of course, the name of Port Blair has not been changed, but it has been called Shahid Dweep, it has been called various things. Mount Harriet is now called Mount Manipur. Mount Harriet was a very important place in in uh, in uh, Andamans uh, because a lot of our, our prisoners there were kept. They were from Manipur, so it's called Mount Manipur. So a lot of changes of names are taking place. Now, Andamans itself is a very fascinating story. Andaman and Nicobar, again, have two different stories. But the penal settlements of, of, of uh, Andamans is a, is actually one one has to really, you know, uh, you know uh, accept the fact that that it was, uh, I mean, the sort of uh, uh, the, the sort of sacrifices which our freedom fighters have made uh, at that point of time. Uh, I'm, I'm writing a, a little series on, on on Andaman and Nicobar Island as well. So when we discuss it in detail, we'll have that thing. So we must pause here for. I mean, we'll have to pause here because uh, time is like a gypsy; it just flies. And the next important thing that we have on the annual is delimitation. Now. Uh, you know, we do a literature festival called the Valley of Words. We're happy that our that our board member General Pannu is here with us. Uh, and uh, you know, in uh, Valley of Words, we discuss the whole aspect of delimitation because what is going to happen is that in to in, in 1971, the last delimitation happened in the country. But from 1971 to now, we have grown. We've grown much bigger than 19. I mean, we did not grow as much from 1952. When the first delimitation was held to 1971, the growth was okay. So forward less than 400 seats, we came to 552 seats. But if we were to uh, to look at the constituencies today, so that's why this new parliament, uh, you know, this 800 seater, because today a typical MP is uh, representing something like 15 to 20 lakh uh, voters. And even an MLA in some places is representing about 4 to 5 lakh voters. And, in you know, again, in Lakshwadeep, he represents much less. But that's a much larger issue. I'll leave that to uh, to the lead discussion to uh, not only comment on this, but also to take the discussion on delimitation forward. And with this, I think I can take my seat there. Yeah, and sir, please join. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, sir, for this very interesting, uh, you know, remarks. And I'm going to be, uh, you know, picking on from all the important arguments that you made. So you said that history is connected. And, uh, you know, allow me to share this very important primary information. Why I say primary information? Because while we were curating this session, Vox Populi, speaking out and reaching out to parliamentarians across political parties, the arguments what we heard uh, with reference to the entire North-South resistance that Sir pointed out with reference to 1956 report, the very big argument of demographics being connected to governance dynamics. This, these two important arguments have been you know, voiced out uh, by uh, various political uh, uh, members of parliament from various political parties while we were addressing the bigger question of delimitation. Uh, Tanjit, so, you know, we all know that four delimitation commissions have been set up. You know, our seats were frozen till uh, uh, 2026. We all know, we are hearing it from various sources that there is a proposed idea to redraw, uh, you know, Lok Sabha constituencies. Once again, you know, backing uh, the argument that why we reached out to all political parties, the, uh, the all the major political parties, the members from the government, there is a consensus, consensus with reference that there is a need to change. There is a need to accept and adapt ourselves to reforms. Because, of course, you know, text and context have changed. Uh, the, you know, we have to uh, be in concern with changed realities. But on that note, you know, what you pointed out, that how with reference to the diverging population trends, right, you know, with reference to North and South dynamics, you know, our uh, me the members of parliament for whom we spoke to from Telanga or from Telangana, from Odisha, from Kerala, they openly voiced out this concern that why should be states which have, you know, which have managed their population trends or their demographics better, why should they be penalized uh, with reference to that? You know, while you were uh, pointing out uh, your, uh, you know, various arguments that how quite often support for proposals has to be, you know, vetted by the political sensibilities also. Why we address the topic of delimitation, once again, there is this issue that will it be the same story again, that it will be having dominance of North over South, 
with respect to Uttar Pradesh having more people, you know, because if you try to balance the demographics with reference to the territorial governance aspect, once again, the story will be the same that we'll be having dominance of UP. And then, uh, but, uh, you know, is this big decision of reforms, though always welcome. And again, you know, we have uh, the Vox Populi this year where we had uh, you know, the eight MPs in official, but uh, allow me to share this to you. Very interesting thing that we had to delimit the number of MPs also. We see a phenomenal response. We, you know, MPs from all political parties came forward, expressed their views, but we had to delimit it. Well. So we reached out to 12 MPs and we had to delimit it to eight MPs, keeping you know pace with the timings of the program also. But there was this very important argument that has been made by all, uh, you know, uh, and again, when we talk about the 2000 uh, delimitation, we had someone from Madhya Pradesh pointing out that whether in this futuristic exercise of delimitation, will it have this overdose of political contouring also? So your remarks on that. You see, uh, uh, one of the things that is very clear is that if the delimitation exercise is done in 2026, we will have to, you know, there's the, the, the doctrine of adequacy of representation, the doctrine of proportionality. I, for one, am very clear that, you know, uh, representation will have to be given on the basis of population. Therefore, this means that we need to reorganize our states because you can't have states which are so large and because you cannot change the size of Sikkim, you cannot change the size of Lakshadweep, you cannot change the size of Manipur or Tripura or any of these states. So I think it's time that we had a new reorganization commission which takes into account uh, not just the the areas that can be there. So I think because in, and as a matter of fact, the UP Assembly is already on record wanting a division of UP. The the the, the resolution has not been overturned. Uh, so I think uh, that uh, it's high time that we had a new reorganization commission, and the larger states are reorganized into smaller units. So uh, that you know, typically, uh, to my mind, I mean, India can afford to have 50 states, 60 states, where no state should have more than you know about. 20 to 30 to 40 MPs at best, so that you know there is some sort of parity. You cannot have states with 100 MPs and states with just two MPs or three MPs. Now, obviously, uh, we cannot trade 100 states, but certainly it's time that uh, both for purposes of administration and also for purposes of parity. You know, so I think it's high time that uh, the second reorganization commission was set up. And this time, if the reorganization commission is set up, it should be very inclusive in its approach because. The last uh, reorganization commission that we had was basically jurists, and uh, I mean they were not in active politics. They were academics, and they were you know uh, people from the world of history, from the world of this. But I think uh, we need to have a very broad-based uh, uh, states reorganization commission, which will look at the administrative boundaries of states, political boundaries of states, because we do need to ensure that there is some parity among the states of Bharat, because that's the point which I keep on saying that we the people have created Bharat. But we the people of the country also have to look at how many states there have to be because there has to be parity between states. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll have a situation where, where the domination of one state over all the rest will continue forever and ever and ever, and that may not be politically acceptable. No, I, I won't use the word may not. I, I, I would say will not be acceptable. And you cannot have uh, a yet another round of dissonance on an issue which we can resolve. So now that we have still five years to go, I think it's time for the political leadership of the country, uh, the administrative leadership of the country to, to at least point out that these are going to be the difficulties, so let's just sort it out. And let me tell you, it makes very, very, take the case of Uttarakhand. You know, when Uttarakhand was made, there were 70 seats, 42 were in the hills, and 28 were in the plains. Now, after uh, the, in the next set, it was 36 in the hills and 34 in the plains. Now, these are all realities that we have to accept. These are all realities that we also have to understand that can there be alternate ways of giving political expression? Can it be through councils? Can it be through a, through a new, empowered, six schedule? Uh, I mean, what are the ways in which we can handle this? But these are problems that are going to come up. Now, the point is that before these problems come up, and we have five years uh, to look into these issues, so I think as political scientists, as, uh, as, as those who are interested and invested in this country, we must start looking ahead and start preparing for these questions as they will appear. One more over here, sir. So, of course, you've really, you know, thoroughly engaged all of us in this wonderful, beautiful, historical uh, journey of the country. Uh, 
but you also know that you have you have a wonderful administrative side also because why i present why i uh, point this out because the question of delimitation is linked to the question of governance also while we were speaking to a lot of mps they said that you have to now understand that as an input if you are trying to redraw the boundaries or, or the number of constituencies or perhaps increase the number of seats uh, in the national legislature with the expectation of the out, uh, outcome that uh, we will be having good governance as the uh, output but you know when you look at the present structure there are so many political parties there are so many mps which which hardly get any time to address their concerns or perhaps looking at the bigger picture of how the entire electoral machinery is somewhere working you know in a manner which favors those which have more resources as compared to the other so in that realm sir will delimitation alone be sufficient enough to cater to the big question of governance then no no delimitation cannot be the solution to every problem in this country i mean delimitation is just one of the issues which is there i mean there's a much larger issue about about uh, about how we running our country because as a point which which uh, which many mps including manish tiwari has made that you know parliamentarians are not getting the time uh, or the or, or, or the or the resources to actually legislate in fact when 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 uh, when parliamentarians and legislators have to nurture their constituencies that is actually an administrative work so oh, that's another question on whether whether we can continue because it is actually a de facto presidential form of government that we have i mean the 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 votes are cast in the name of the of the prime minister or the chief minister so that is it's actually it's a de facto uh, presidential form of government that we already have but that's not the that, that's not what the what the what the topic of today is uh, but um, you know the 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 larger issue is about is about uh, about how uh states will have to be reorganized or so states can be reorganized in fact there is a famous case of just the same chandra gupta when when uh, bengal wanted to when he when when he didn't want the areas of uh, bengal berubari and he didn't want them to go to uh, bangladesh or to bengal he said that the the uh, that, that i am a citizen of bengal the, the court struck it down he said there nobody is a citizen of bengal but one thing is there that and i i must share this incident with you that in 1992 when we had to hand over team biga to bangladesh you know it's taken us so long to settle our disputes with bangladesh in fact uh, hats off now uh, that that we now solved our enclave exclave problem but in 1992 i was the adm of kuchbihar and i was writing this paper uh, i'm preparing the background note for this discussion so at that point of time also it was pointed out that india cannot hand over team biga so india leased team biga for 999 years at a lease rent of rupee 1 which the president of india was then pleased to you know to say ki theek hai chhod dete hain matlab we are a rich country we don't need rupee 1 <laughs> from bangladesh but that apart the fact is you see technically technically teen bega is still a part of india so technically the president can withdraw his uh, his happiness i mean the president can be pleased to take teen bega back you know so these are all the interesting uh, aspects about about uh, the way we have to evolve the way we look at things that so one of the things that that comes out remarkably in my in my and in, in the research which i'm doing is that you know countries which are flexible and nimble and which have the ability to absorb uh, tensions and to adjust and to and to take into account the aspirations of people they do well in contrast to those who are very rigid i mean take the case of uh, our neighboring country pakistan in pakistan uh why at the time in 1956 when india was creating many states pakistan decided to make one unit pakistan actually actually you know abolished punjab and sindh and nwfp and made one unit so <clears throat> it was a very interesting contrast between india and pakistan india celebrating and respecting her diversity in fact today i was talking to the cambodians uh, in the morning Uh, I was addressing the Cambodian civil servant. They said, "How do you manage it?" I said, "We man manage it like the Indian Indian currency." So I showed them the Indian currency with twenty two with you know two thousand rupees written in you know twenty two languages. So they, how do you do it? I said, "We do it and we celebrate it." I mean, there's no problem. There's no problem. In fact, the more you celebrate diversity, uh, the more you recognize ethnicities, the more we recognize language, the more we recognize the difference. The concept is that Bharat. I mean, the concept of Bharat as India. now that is the sacro sanct thing now what happens within the borders of the india we got to be flexible we got to be nimble and if we are more nimble we'll do much better and, and can the country has shown uh, and in fact over the last few years there's a there's a bipartisan consensus uh, that that we must respect 
uh, regional aspirations. We must respect various languages. So I think uh, we are uh, we are on the on the right track. This delimitation is going to pose a challenge, but I'm sure we have the political sagacity to handle this. Uh, Dr. Chopra, I think I, I want to really uh, again, once again thank you for uh, for these uh, both the lecture as well as the comments uh, that followed Dr. Mirza's uh, points. Uh, I do apologize if, uh, like you know, for rushing you through because I know what the audience heard today uh, is really a glimpse, and uh, I really encourage uh, uh, all of you to kind of. Uh, before the book comes out, uh, the, the, the specific stories uh, that uh, Dr. Chopra has been publishing um, uh, in the media. Uh, if I may, like, uh, I, I want to sort of, I really uh, picking on your last point about this, how do you strike a balance uh, between uh, we the people of Bharat uh, alongside uh, we the people of whatever that identity might be, uh, this Bengal uh, being a very good example, uh, I think that uh, striking that balance, obviously, as you, if I can uh, uh, kind of infer from that, requires some degree of maturity uh, with regards to being secure about the notion of we the people of Bharat. Uh, I think like th this tension of uh, allowing for uh, regional aspirations, and I too concur with you with you that over the last decade or two, there is uh, that maturity is coming. But alongside that political uh, maturity, I was wondering if you could speak to the administrative aspect. So the, 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 the Indian uh, Administrative Service, or uh, to my knowledge of the little I've learned uh, over the last year, uh, is an all India service. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, so that's like the, we the people of Bharat kind of analogy, you know, so it's an all India service, it's a service to the country. Um, but at the same time, the functioning and the day to day aspect uh, throughout your bulk of your career is kind of tied to a state, uh, if not half of that to the district within the state. So do you see like, you know, as we think about this, it's not just a boundary issue and that I've come to appreciate uh, in our discussions. Uh, so how do you, this is something that I've been thinking about uh, having learned uh, about the academy and the civil service a little bit. How, how do we then, is there a need to also sort of think about not a reorganization, I'm uh, whatever we want to call it reform or, how do we bring that into this thing? You know, this, this all India service notion, but at the same time, most officers to my knowledge are in a state uh, with some deputation to the center. Uh, so if you could speak uh, something to that, uh, I would Thank appreciate it. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting, very important, but I personally think you see that whether you have 30 states uh, and then you're moving from center to state, or you have 50 states and then you're moving mm -hmm. from center to state, it should not pose a major challenge for us because, uh, you know, uh, the, the recruitment will continue to be as it is. In fact, what will happen and what I envisage is a situation where more and more decentralization of functions will start taking place. In fact, as we are speaking, you see, the fact is that with, with GST happening, with the right to food, with right to work, with several national programs being rolled out, uh, a lot of direction of these programs is going to be with the union government. Uh, and uh, most states, um, it's not saying that the states will have, will, will not be very important, but the fact is that most programs that are now being run in the district, most programs that are now being funded in the district are national programs. For instance, whether it is the MREGA, whether it is the right to food or the right to work or the right to education. So the policy parameters are being set by the union government. Uh, they are being implemented at the level of the states. What will happen is that that uh, there will be a direct connect between the state and the districts. I mean, intermediate levels, I mean, the, the role of divisional commissioners, for example, will go down. Uh, a lot of other things will start happening. But, but I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't see a problem if instead of a large state like UP, there were four, uh, uh, you know, states. And so, so we are looking at what I would ideally look at, a, look at about 50 states in the country, uh, you know, where uh, it'll be easier for the, uh, for the chief ministers also to connect, it'll be easier for, because at the end of the day, it is the implementation of programs that's going to make a difference. 
And as you've been working in the health sector, uh, even at the level of the, even when it comes to monitoring, uh, uh, let's say that, you know, a chief secretary or a chief minister has to review. I mean, if you have to review 20 districts or 25 districts, it's possible. If you have to review 100 districts, then how are you going to do it? I mean, how do you even have a meeting with 100 district magistrates? So it's, it's, it is posing because the other thing is that, you know, people are also aspiring for smaller districts. People are also aspiring for smaller plots because everybody wants a direct share in the way things are happening. So we also started, Mr. Prashir is here, I think he'll bear me out that at that some point of time, Punjab had got to the United Punjab, there are about 13 districts. Now I think there are 14, 15, 18 districts in Punjab. There are about similar number of districts in Haryana. So, you know, so the number of districts has increased, the number of blocks is increasing, number of tehsils is increasing. So managing these also means that you have to have smaller states. At the end of the day, you know, Bharat as a concept, and Bharat as a concept, I'll take it back, I'll take you back to the very first chapter of Mahabharat, uh, very first chapter of the Gita, in which, you know, uh, Dhritarashtra is telling Sanjay to recount to him which are the armies on the Kaurava side and which are the armies on the Pandava side, right? So the concept of Bharat, is there, it's been there. So sometimes Matsya Pradesh will become part of Rajputana, sometimes this will become part of that. So this uh, this uh, this little amorphous thing is always happening. Take the case of Odisha, for example. I mean, sometimes it, this portion goes there, this portion goes there, but in a sense, roughly, we know where things are happening. So I think it will be a very welcome thing if we, and and, and the, 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 the whole thing is that, that you can belong to a state, you can belong to a linguistic group, and you belong to Bharat at the same time. So there's no contradiction uh, to my mind. And as we have more districts, more tessils, more blocks, we will need smaller states, you know. <laughs> and it will also, I think, to a large extent, I think most uh, political parties uh, are now more or less uh, agreed on the fact that smaller... And then the empirical evidence of uh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Uttarakhand, Telangana also shows that if you have a smaller state, you tend to do better. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, no, thank you so much, uh, 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 Dr. Chopra. I think like, uh, as you know, like we have briefly discussed uh, this notion of also at the district level, but I can see from some of the remarks that you have made, once you make the state smaller, you kind of uh, change that both the, the identity and the governance aspect gets kind of more merged together, which, which is really the, the goal, I guess. And uh, I really appreciate that. You know, I think I don't want to hog, hog the like you know the privilege of being a moderator or I'm not being discussant. Uh, so you know, maybe let's open this up. Uh, I'm not to like you know for yeah. the brief uh, ten or fifteen minutes we have with the uh, audience. Yes, sir. Well, there's yeah. a very interesting question in the chat box, and uh, you know, Sanjeev, sir, this is something very similar to what you were talking about that how the idea of Bharat is so holistic. Now, this question says that how is state identity detrimental to national unity? It is, it is not. A, a, a good Punjabi or a good Mizo or a good Naga is also a good Bharatiya. So I think there is no contradiction. In fact, you become better. Uh, there is no problem at all. I mean, you can have multiple identities. You can, be a, you can be a good Christian. You can be a good Hindu. You could be a good Muslim. You could have multiple identities. And, and, and yet your concept of being Bharatiya. In fact, the whole thing about being Bharatiya is and that's why, you know, the word Bharat, it, it comes to us from a very ancient time. So there is no contradiction as such. And, and, and the, the, more, the more identities we take on, these identities are, are, are working together. They don't uh, take away, I mean, uh, my coming from Punjab and some his coming from Orissa and his coming from UP does not make us lesser, lesser Bharatiyas. In fact, it makes us stronger. That has been the concept of Bharat. I mean, even uh, at the time when I'm telling you about this, uh, this opening canto in the Gita, it starts with which are the armies of Bharat. So he's talking about Bharat and says which armies of Bharat are fighting with whom. And you had the same kingdom, uh, half of the army is fighting for the Korvas and half of the army is fighting for the Pandavas. It's okay, you know. <clears throat> and they were neutral. I mean, five uh, states were neutral, including Kashmir was neutral at that time. So it's an interesting story. Okay, uh, my last one before I invite questions from across the dais also. So this one's asking for a candid yes or no from you that do you believe that is it convenient to serve and do development work with smaller number of population? Or... Yes, I think uh, development, uh, we, we can focus better uh, if the population size is small. I mean, in the sense that if, if you know exactly what your district size is, 
uh, I, I, I was the DM of Murshidabad in West Bengal, which is which was a very very large district, and I can tell you it was a. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed it for two years. I mean, I, but the fact is that it is not really possible to give adequate time and attention if the district size at the 1994 had a population of 70 lakhs, 29 development blocks, you know, and five subdivisions, 95 kilometer border. Uh, one turns, uh, I mean, one has retained one sanity. Uh, but the fact is that if the district size is smaller, it makes more sense. I think an ideal district size about, you know, about eight. 10 to 12 development blocks, two to three subdivisions, about 20 lakh population. This is what a district magistrate, what a superintendent of police, what a CDO, what a, and in fact, not just for the DM, it's also for the district health officer. It's also for the district agricultural officer. Imagine a district agricultural officer in a predominantly rural area, I mean, handling 60 lakhs. I mean, how is it possible? It's, it's, it's a major strain. So I think for, for monitoring, for development, for intervention, we need to have an ideal district size, we need to have an ideal state size. And of course, the size of India is, is sacrosanct, that we cannot change. But what we can change, we ought to change. Great, sir. So we now invite questions from across the dais. Yes. Yeah, yeah. you said that the one state is dominating Indian polity, like UP earlier, it was known as United Provinces. So, but uh, UP Legislative Assembly has passed a resolution uh, for dividing it into four states. So then it will be like 85 seats, to 80 seats, 20 each, uh, 20 odd. So then uh, it will not be there. It will no longer be there if it is, it, if it becomes a reality. Yeah, that's true. In fact, Dr. Mitso, what happens is that if there are four UPs and Kerala will not feel so threatened. Mm -hmm. Feel so threatened. You know, because with 13 seats or 14 seats, and, and of which some of them will disappear if the if the new population area is done. So Kerala will not feel threatened. Kerala doesn't feel threatened from, from Uttarakhand, for example. It doesn't feel threatened. But when we look at it from an all India perspective, you know, so imagine that you are from Kerala. I mean, you are an MP from Kerala. So everybody, if, if everybody, so you, you, so if every state has got about 20, 30, 40 MPs, there will still be some parity among states. But if, if the Delimitation happens and seats are distributed according to current population, then UP will exceed 120 people, 120, and Kerala will come down. So you will have a major anomaly which will not be acceptable. I mean, which will, I mean, if you are from Kerala, you will not accept. I don't know where you are from. But, but. seats can go down also, like in Kerala. Uh, I mean, they are going down. This is precisely the point that states which have done well in population parameters, the state, they pop, they, they, seats will go. Seats will go down in Tamil Nadu, they'll go down in Karnataka, they'll go down in Kerala. They'll go up in Bihar, they'll go up in UP, they'll go up in Rajasthan. So you will end up with, if you will end up, I mean, a ballpark figure, you will end up with 120 seats in UP. Well, a population per uh, constituency would be fixed, like 5 lakh per uh, uh, constituency. It can never be fixed, but there has to be, there are two doctrines. There's a doctrine of adequacy. They will continue to have an MP, you know, but uh, where we can, so both aspects will have to be taken into account adequacy and proportionality. So you will never have a perfect scale. You'll never have that, you know, every, you cannot distribute and say that for every, uh, there'll be areas where you will still have 25 lakh people, there'll be areas where you still have, but you cannot have areas with, you know, 30 lakh people and areas with 1 lakh people. So we have to try to narrow it down to the extent possible, to the extent that is practical. But how will the parity come about? Because there are uh, uh, smaller states, five seats, or two seats. So or parity seven. is that instead of five versus 120, we'll have five with 25 or five with 30. That is the only way you know we can look at. Yes, you wanted. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Hello. Yeah. Hello, sir. So you rightly said that we have got five years now. And with the new India already there in the form of digital India, the digital India scenario is all over. And do as civil society so that we can place rightly this good governance kind of thought process in the e-governance way before the political parties as well as the ruling party to start with. I can only say that, you know, the more uh, 
uh, the, the more politically aware uh, the population is, the better it would be. But e-governance uh, initiatives are there. I mean, I, I don't think it is directly related to uh, to this. But the only thing that I think what I, I, I don't have a clear answer to your question because uh, I, I don't know how to respond. Utilizing this digital platform, digital India kind of thought process, yes. let's draw a map. No, we can a map in such a way that what we are talking that we need the 50 states. We can do that homework. No, no, that homework cannot be done through, through through digital India. I mean, digital India can address many issues, but this is not an issue which which digital India can address. I mean, digital India will of course increase access. We can monitor our schemes better, but this is a largely this is a question of political economy. This is a question where political parties, uh, political groups, we'll have to sit together and we'll have to look at the at the long range uh, implications of what happens if we, if we do not. Now, there, there are three scenarios. One scenario is that we continue and say, all right, for the next 25 years, we do not do the delimitation. Because the fact is that the population in this country started stabilizing. That, that thing that, that, that reports also already say. So one option is that let's not do anything in 2026. Let's wait till 2051. By which time it is also possible that by which time UP's population is also stabilized and all other population is stabilized. So that's one option. Second option is let's take the bull by the horns and reorganize ourselves. The third option is that let's wait for agitations to start happening and then we react to it. No, so there are three. So, no, no, it is not. There are there are three scenarios, right? Because there'll be some people who will want delimitation. And there are other aspects is that if we do not have delimitation, then by 2035, perhaps there'll be districts in, in UP, where you'll have 35 lakh people, I mean, an MP handling 35 lakh people. I mean, of course, our, our honorable be. member of parliament, I mean, of course, he's in the Rajya Sabha, he doesn't have that kind of problem which a Lok Sabha MP has, but it's 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 an impossibility paradigm. In fact, the 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 ego and so the or the connectivity or the mobile to the MP actually increases the MP's problem because uh, everybody is wanting to contact the MLA and the MP and the MLA and the MP, it cannot really respond to 4 lakh people. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. So again, from the e-governance and from the mobile uh, you know, aspect, I think you will need smaller uh, units. But they say e-governance yeah, is easy governance kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, let them respond. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to all this. Thank you. In Thank you. Better Thank way. You, Dr. Chopra. Very insightful. In fact, uh, you know, we keep joking that a typical MP in India, uh, in terms of population, is equivalent to the head of a small country. Yes. Right? So, <laughs> so, so I have a small query on Goa, since you refer to Goa, though it's not directly related to this talk. Goa got liberated in December 1961. Yes. By then, the relations uh, with China was extremely frosty. Yes. The Chinese Premier John Lai's visit was a failure, and, and so on. But China was one of the earliest countries to recognize yes. uh, the, you know, the, the liberation of Goa and, and its uh, merger with India. Why? No, this is also largely to do with the global politics. It's also got to do with the anti-colonial, uh, you know, uh, measure that, that that China was always taking. And India and China, you know, have been supporting each other diplomatically. And the Afro-Asian bloc, in fact, both uh, Africa, uh, sorry, both China and India were wanting to, you know, show to the rest of the colonized world that we are with you. That is one thing. But on the issue of Goa, thank you for pointing out. Thank you for bringing. Goa is one state in the country where there is uniform civil code. Yes. Uh, few people are aware of the fact that the uniform civil code was started in Goa by the Portuguese. So every regime does something which is good. So in Goa, where you have a mix of Christians and Muslims and Hindus, you've been having uniform civil code in Goa. I, I don't know why we can't pick up some good practices from here, there, and everywhere. So Goa also teaches a lot of things. Uh, a very interesting thing I want to tell you about Goa is about Dadra and Nagaraveli. For six years, Dadra and Nagaraveli was a de facto liberated territory, in the sense that you know the the uh, the uh, earlier, of course, you remember this film South Hindustani uh, with Amitabh Bachchan's first uh, star. So South Hindustani, uh, you know the the people of the MGK and the RSS and the others, RS Samajas, they went and took over Dadra and Nagara really. And for six years, <clears throat> it was an independent area. In 1961, an IAS officer by the name of KJ Bijlani was declared as the Prime Minister of Dadra and Nagara really, And he signed an agreement with Mr. Nehru as the Prime Minister. So that was the only time when an IAS officer became a Prime Minister. Uh, so he could sign an agreement with <laughs> Nehru. So that's uh, something, this little interesting story about Dadra and Nagaraveli. Really. Mr. Lami, I have a uh, 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm a voter of small states, and you did, you know, talk about empirical evidence in in favor of small states doing better in terms of governance and development, and and. And 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 we, uh, you also talked of you know India having at least 50, 60 states. Now where do you draw the line? For instance, I come from Odisha, so I come from western part of Odisha where there is a separate dialect. So my dialect is not Odia. The Odia, the official Odia spoken in coastal part of Odisha. We speak a language which is Kosali, and there is a simmering demand for a separate Kosali state now. So I mean, every every hundred kilometers you'll have a separate culture, separate dialect, separate you know way of life. So. Where do you draw that line? Once you open the floodgate of more and more smaller states, yes, sir, the, I, I mean, there is. I've been, I've been looking at the, at the because there's a lot of information on the website and the internet on demand for new states. The maximum number of states that have been asked for is another, is another fourteen or fifteen states. I mean, if including that Kodu Nadu and Tamil Nadu and you know two Maharashtras, Vidarbha being separate. So the, the maximum demand as, as things stand now is to another about 12, 13 states. Maximum it will be another. Now there are some states which cannot happen. I mean Gorkha land, for example, uh, cannot happen because the Gorkhas are not in a majority, even in Darjeeling. You know, so these are some issues. Therefore, Gorkha land will not happen, but a North Bengal. Uh, well, I, I hope my chief, uh, ex chief minister is not listening. <laughs> but even if she does, I'm now superannuated so I can <laughs> take the money. <laughs> but you know, North Bengal by itself, I mean, uh, uh, above Murshidabad, above Murshidabad, so Malda and above, yeah, that's a viable state by itself. But Gurkhaland is not a state by itself. So every demand cannot lead to a state. You know, Bodos are not in a majority, even in Kokracha. So there are, there are, so you just because you have a demand, but that demand must be backed by a, by, a, by a strong demographics and by a strong ethnicity and by a well understood language. So if that happens, then why not? And we could also have states which are just so large. I mean, Vidal, for example, is a, is, a, is, a, is a fit case. You can have two Maharashtras. There is the problem in that. And uh, so if it's. Uh, yes, Sunil. I'm not. Like, yeah, I, yeah Sorry. Sanjay. Just uh, uh, like uh, as he asked. So, do you also think that economic viability is also a factor? Well, like economic as you said in case see, of Nagaland. In Nagaland, those were days when now today economic viability is very different uh, than it was in those days. Today, with the with very with very strong IT connectivity and various things, things have changed. I mean, for instance, if you have if you have a series of call centers in a in a state in which people are speaking English language, it becomes viable. I mean, Arunachal is viable if you look at you know modern agriculture. So viability is a function of, of many things today. So viability is, I mean, the, vi the way we looked at viability in those days was a very different thing. Certainly, I have, that is why I said that I would look at a state with about you know, 20, 25 MPs, with about 20, 25 districts, which is a viable state. And again, the point is, you see that we also will need to address our administrative structures. We do not need I mean, if we are going to have small states, then we may do away with directorates. We may do away with, we'll have a different set of governance because, you know, we are used to governing in the manner that the message will come from the top and then it will be disseminated in several layers. But I'll give you an example. Now, when this uh, this, this new COVID, Omnicron or whatever it's called, now the day the, the Home Secretary had a meeting, he had a meeting, immediately it got disseminated to all the states in the country, all the districts in the country. So you don't really require I mean, the WhatsApp says it all. So you don't require layers and layers and layers today. So the whole thing is is, is changing. So, Sunil, you wanted to say. It was almost the same uh, question, sir. But again, uh, if I just quote the bifurcation of Bihar and Jharkhand, sharing of financial resources of the bifurcated states and the governance thereof, that also uh, is a thing to be thought of. Sir. Oh, yes. We have now got the experience of dividing assets. We've got a lot of experience now. We've got experience in dividing cutters. We've got experience of dividing it. So it's not going to be as difficult. It's not going to be as difficult as it was between Punjab and Haryana. You know, we're still fighting over Chandigarh. We're still fighting over these things. But as we evolve, as we evolve, I mean, now more or less, I mean, today, if a, if a new state has to be created, I mean, the Ministry of Home Affairs has a, has a whole, uh, you know, set of precedents to follow. You know, so it's easier to, it's easier to reorganize states today than it would have been in the times of 1953 when the first state was reorganized. So, you know, we are evolving, we are learning. So I think there will be problems. I mean, look, we cannot envisage a, envisage a situation where there'll be no problems. There will always be problems. I see, and I along with this, there's also the question now of reorganization of district boundaries. You have crazy district boundaries also. 
you know, in mm -hmm. uh, Kuch Bihar, for example, I mean, one part is there, it's closer to Punjab. I mean, you have Kapoor Sala, Pagwada, Kapoor. So I think it's also time to reorganize the districts to make them more, uh, to make them more at ease with each other. Just because something was settled and it, we had promised the Maharaj of Kuch Bihar that Kuch Bihar will not change, doesn't mean that a person in, in Dinahata or a person in Meklikan will have to travel all the way. He could be attached to Alipur Dwar. So I think it's time. I mean, there are areas in, in Masuri, for example. I mean, uh, uh, parts of Teri Garwar are on the other side of Masuri. So it can be easily avoided. So I think it's time that we took a, took a more uh, realistic look at things. We took a more, we looked at the cost of administration and so many other factors. Sir, but in this case, uh, what is happening? Like Bihar is seeking a special status, economic status, and the resources which has gone down to uh, Jharkhand, you have a surplus state in revenue. And that, with the division, you have a state uh, which has a cash surplus on uh, terms of mines, resources, et cetera, and one state which is exclusively a gradient state. And we have a divide there. So how do you balance that? No, you cannot. I mean, every state cannot be equal. The fact is that there will be some states which will do better than the rest. I mean, nothing will remain constant. You see, there was a time when Punjab was the leading state in the country. It is now eight. It has to happen. I mean, so somebody will gain. And, and But again, you see, why are we looking at things in a very static mode? I mean, things can change very dynamically. You know, things can change. I mean, the amount of, and, and again, you know, because of migration, because of a lot of other things, a lot of other factors are there now with, you know, so these things will happen. These things will continue to happen. You cannot have a perfect political system. And why, why we, the, the center will have to close down. I mean, the political science departments will have to close down. I mean, all our lecture circuit will have to close down if everything was perfect. So I think in the interest of the Lakshmi Mittal South Asia Institute, let there be some minor issues here and there. What will send it to? Yes, I didn't also come from Jarvan for... Uh... Yeah, yeah. So I think... Uh, I think uh, we should, uh, in the interest of... Uh, this is really, uh, as I think what uh, Dr. Chopra has clearly instigated here is uh, is a... Uh, is a framework, you know, and uh, uh, for all us to think, I, I, I'm uh, just being very mindful of the time uh, of uh, Dr. Chopra. I think we are hitting that and if people need to leave and uh, uh, I'm sure like there are lots of questions, which is the goal of this, uh, this particular uh, discussion series. And I feel that uh, he has touched upon a variety of topics that we can uh, continue to think about and uh, I don't know if there is going to be people hanging around. I'm unfortunately not in that position to, to continue this conversation over a dinner or something, but uh, Dr. Chopra, I'll see you soon, hopefully in the new year um, uh, uh, again. So I uh, was being my yeah. 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 So nice to interact with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Subhu. Thank you for your time and waking yeah. up so early to meet us and moderate the session. Thank you so no, much. No, it, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Amna. I just want to again uh, thank all the audience there uh, who were able to come there uh, and for the engaged discussions and also those who are uh, online. Um, so what a privilege it's been. Like, you know, I have heard every time I hear this talk, I, I see, I hear something new. And one of the things that in the library, every time uh, he, he would say it would be a kind of a Oh, Subhu, I, I, today I, I, I have a new thing to share with you that he would have gained an insight, whether it's the, it's about uh, from his, uh, you know, recent, uh, I guess his evolving or the new learning project that he's already started engaging with, which is the language of Sanskrit and, and reading through uh, Bhagavad Gita. So, so more on that later, maybe that's a whole other topic uh, uh, and the uh, contemporary relevance that may have for us. So anyway, once again, uh, please uh, join me in, uh, in thanking uh, Dr. Chopra. Uh, and thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you.